Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Tonight, we're going to continue our series of talks with elected officials uh, where we're going to explore in greater detail some of the big issues of the day. And perhaps this session, nothing has been bigger than the Roadworks program, which is the name that the governor gave uh, to the program to rebuild our roads and bridges and install a process where we could uh, impose tolls on large trucks. And with us today, we have the House Majority Leader, John Simone. John, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jimmy. I certainly appreciate having a, a Majority Leader uh, in our studio today. <laughs> People outside the, the building, outside the State House, probably don't have a sense on what the Majority Leader does. And in a nutshell, what, what could you tell our viewers about what your role is? Well, I think my role as Majority Leader is to uh, listen to the Democratic members of the House and to uh, set an agenda that's formulated you know, through the Speaker's office, set an agenda, a Democratic agenda, and, and uh, shepherd that agenda through the House, and at the same time listening to the members and, and trying to focus their ideas on, on things that really represent the, the values of the Democratic Party and, and the membership, and try and focus that into something good to help the state and people of Rhode Island. Sure. You've been in the assembly for a while. You were first elected in nine, 1992, wasn't 1992, it? 1992. And your district five, uh, what, what neighborhoods of Providence does that encompass? Well, it started out encompassing the North End and, and a little bit of Merrillville in North Providence. And then over the past three uh, redistricting uh, changes we've had, it now encompasses uh, most of the North End uh, of Providence, the Charles Street area. Uh, Wanskitty area and also uh, some of the Elmhurst area of Providence. So now I am entirely within the boundary of Providence, but I have three pretty uh, separate uh, neighborhoods that I represent. So what got you involved in politics? Why, why did you run for office in 92? Well, uh, I was a political science major at Providence College. I grew up in the area that I represent, uh, the Charles Street, uh, Eagle Park area of Providence, which was a, a hotbed for politics. So I grew up in a very political uh, ethnic neighborhood, and uh, politics was just something that was uh, in everybody's, uh, uh, you know, uh, mind. I mean, we, we had really tough campaigns in them days, and I enjoyed it. And uh, you know, the neighborhood people would take sides, and so it was just something that I, I just thought uh, I was always interested in. Yeah. So when I had an opportunity to run, I, I decided to run in 1992. Was that your first attempt at elected office, running for the House of Representatives? Yes, that was the first time I ever ran for any public office. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, at the end of the banking crisis. The banking crisis was in the 19, you know, early 1990. And so uh, a lot of new members came into the House, actually. I think, I think, uh, I know we had the largest class uh, in 1992. I think it was about 30, 36 new members uh, from, from that era. So you've obviously worked on a whole host of issues over time, but uh, t tonight we'd like to focus on, on this big issue of the day, which is legislation that's already been enacted. What, what got you involved in, in actually to the point where you were the sponsor of the Roadworks legislation on the House? Uh, and, uh, and listening to, uh, to the business community, which uh, pretty much told us uh, in a letter that uh, Rhode Island had the worst uh, roads and bridges. We were ranked 50th in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so after looking at the impact study, the economic impact study, and realizing that it would create 6,000 new jobs, and as a result of getting new federal money uh, that wasn't around the year before, uh, we were able to tailor a piece of legislation that, that I sponsored 
Uh, and uh, I think that that legislation will really help the people of Rhode Island. Uh, number one, uh, we were able to decrease the, uh, the length of funding from 30 years to 15 years. Uh, we saved uh, at least, I think, $300 million in the interest payment from the original bill. Uh, and uh, we were able, due to the, the way we borrowed the money, we were able to keep the cap down from $30 originally to now $20. And uh, the, the cap on what? The, the cap is that on a daily amount? A daily amount. So now, pay? if you went all around every toll uh, in the in the in the uh, state, the most it would cost you would be twenty dollars if you didn't leave the state. And that's right in the state law. And that's that's capped right in the state mm -hmm. law. And also, we put in the law that if you ever were going to toll cars, that you had to go for voter approval. So those were very important uh, new. Uh, provisions of, of the uh, toll bill that ended up passing this year, very recently, obviously. And, and uh, I was happy to introduce it. Of course, uh, you know, w when, when the business community comes to you and the governor comes to you and says, uh, you know, we have the worst roads and bridges in the country. And when the business community tells us that one of the most important reasons why a company would come to a state is their infrastructure, we obviously knew we had to do something. So the tolling vehicle was something, you know, the other ideas were, um, you know, increase the gas tax. So in my mind, uh, I didn't think that was quite fair. Uh, there's no question that the large trucks, the tractor trailer trucks, do the most damage. And there's no question that uh, by tolling, it would be the only vehicle where we would get a significant amount of out of state money to help support the damage that's being done to the roads and bridges. So, uh, you know, our estimates are that 60% of the toll money will come from out-of-state truckers. And, and that's important. I think people don't realize that any other plan would involve all the Rhode Island citizens, my constituents, your friends and neighbors, to pay for damage to the roads and to repair the damage to the roads that's really caused, in the most part, by out-of-state truckers and the large in-state in -state truckers, the tractor-trailer truckers. So if we did a gas tax to fix our roads and bridges, that would have hit every single consumer, everyone who drives a car. That wasn't going to be targeted just at the trucks. Exactly. And, and I thought that that was unfair. So in my mind, uh, the bill that we ended up passing uh, affected two groups, the tractor-trailer truckers from inside the state and the tractor trailer trucks from outside the state. Both those groups do the most damage to the roads, and one of those groups, without the tolling, would go right by our state without paying anything. To me, that was unacceptable. And so I think when the, when the people look at that piece of legislation, if you're looking at $40 million a year over the course of 10 years, that's $400 million, 60% of that, 200, $240 million, uh, you know, 60% of that amount of money comes from out-of-state truckers. There's no other vehicle that would produce that, ty that type of money from the out-of-state truckers. And I think that's very important for the people to know. Other than raising the gas tax and knowing that we have to fix our roads and bridges, what other funding mechanisms were pitched in the assembly other, you know, in a, as an alternative to, to doing the tolls on the large well, trucks? Well, I, I think... Uh, I, I think the, the people of no uh, would say, well, why don't you just cut the state budget and fix the roads and bridges with money from cutting the state budgets? It's very nice to say, but, but, the, but the result is that you're cutting money from education, you're cutting money from elderly affairs, you're cutting social services, you know, you're cutting monies from places that need money, need more money than we could give them now, and at the same time, if you do that, number one, we know it doesn't work because that's what we've been doing for years, and we're 50th in the country in infrastructure. And number two, you let the out-of-state truckers, the ones who are doing the most damage, pay nothing. So as a Rhode Islander, why would you accept a plan that we know can't fund it properly, and number two, allows out-of-state truckers to go right through the state of Rhode Island, not pay a dime, and do the most damage? To me, I think if people really look at that, they say, you know, they are right. We should toll the out-of-state truckers. Practically everywhere you go in the Northeast Corridor, there's tolling. And we were the only ones that didn't have it. And I think, you know, we lost all that money for the years that we didn't have it. And I, I think that's very important. And in my mind, 
It was a fairness issue. There's a little bit of cynicism in our state about this being the first step. And uh, I know some people just uh, keep claiming, oh, they're going to extend the toll on our cars. Could you talk about that a little more? I know you put a provision in state law, but uh, yeah. help our, help our um, you know, folks watching understand you know, what, how real that is. Well, initially, let me say, when you hear someone say something that's unfounded and ridiculous, it, it, it merely means that they don't have anything constructive to criticize the plan with. So they think of something that makes no sense, it's unfounded. In fact, in this particular piece of legislation, it's right in the legislation. You cannot have cars unless you go to the voters for approval. It's right in the legislation. Mm -hmm. So anyone who would adhere to that type of propaganda, I think is just being negative. And we have to get away from that. We have to move the state on in a positive direction. While no one wants to toll anybody, uh, we do need to support our infrastructure. And this is a constant revenue source, 60% of which comes from out-of-state tractor-trailer trucks. I know one aspect of this legislation is that um, we're going to get people to work soon and we're going to fix our roads and bridges sooner instead of later. What, what could you tell our viewers about the timeline, about the tolls and about the rebuilding process? Right. Well, this is a 10-year period of time. And over the 10 years where we fix the bridges and the roads, uh, the economic study that I referred to earlier uh, indicated that it would create up to 6,000 jobs repairing the roads. So, you know, the money is going to repairing our roads, we're hiring Rhode Islanders, we're creating 6,000 new jobs, and at the same time, we hope that we're moving Rhode Island from 50th in the nation to some place much higher than that. And that is what the Chamber of Commerce and the, and the people that in the business community have told us is the most important issue regarding businesses coming to Rhode Island or any state, the infrastructure. So I think when you add it all up, we devised a plan that created 6,000 jobs, we're fixing the roads and bridges, and we're moving our state forward. And I think that pretty much sums up RoadWorks Rhode Island. What kind of pushback have you gotten in your, in your neighborhood about, about this issue? Well, I, I think generally speaking, in the state, you know, with the talk shows and, and, and people that are really in the, in the entertainment business, not in the news business. People are, are not given the right information. Uh, but in my neighborhood, when I, when I meet with my constituents, uh, and I explain them the merits of the bill, and I explain to them that we're not tolling cars, and any other plan would mean that they would pay. They would pay, if you drove a motorcycle, you'd be paying more than a, a person who's driving an out-of-state tractor-trailer truck through the state of Rhode Island. And I think when you talk to most people and you tell them exactly what's being done in this bill, what we're trying to accomplish, I'm very confident that most, the vast majority of people would think that this is the better plan. And I've experienced that. When I go you know, around my neighborhood and I talk to people about the roads work uh, bill, they understand that, listen, it's a question of fairness. Why should we take money, uh, you know, raise the gas tax and, and let everybody pay for something where the real culprits, the, and I don't want to call them culprits, but the, the real damage to the roads that are being done by these large trucks, they should be paying something. And that's what the toll bill does. I haven't talked to a single Rhode Islander who doesn't recognize we need to fix our roads and bridges. It's just apparent to anyone who drives a car. Yes. Or rides a bus. Absolutely. And I think the alternative for the assembly um, to doing something was doing nothing. And I imagine that was just not acceptable to the business community who's, who's worried about economic development. Right. And, and, you know, we received support for the piece of legislation, the toll bill, from the province chamber of commerce, from num numerous chambers of commerce. And we learned that uh, from the chamber of commerce uh, that uh, the roads needed to be fixed. So uh, we either could have kicked the can down the road, which obviously probably has been done for many, many years, or we could do something in a positive direction. You know, when the speaker took office, we said that, you know, our focus was going to be on jobs and the economy. When we learned, because I didn't know that, but when we, when we learned during this process that the business community, one of the most important aspects of, of a state that a business community looks at is our infrastructure. And we were 50th in the nation. 
we needed to change something. And, and you, you know, we have to focus on jobs in the economy, and you can't do that when one of the most important factors a business looks at is a, a state's infrastructure. So they went hand in hand. And, and I think that's what the people have to understand. We're, we're moving this state in a positive way towards a positive direction, and, and we have to fix things that have been broken for some time. And that's what we're doing. I certainly appreciate your uh, direct explanation on that. In, in the last couple of minutes we have, um, what can you tell our viewers about other major issues that the Assembly is grappling with this year as we go towards the, the budget season of uh, May and June? Well, I, I can tell you that uh, what I've been looking at uh, this past year is, uh, you know, the building community. Uh, right now in Rhode Island, uh, you know, we have too many roadblocks to uh, developing land and, and zoning and, and building, and we need to uh, modify uh, the current laws that inhibit development. I mean, sometimes you could have someone in Rhode Island who wants to, I hear many times from developers, you know, I want to develop this project, but it's been delayed two years or it's been delayed a year and a half. And I can go to Massachusetts and I can do the same project in six months. We have too many time delays and we need to get our zoning laws and our building codes and our, our, our zoning boards and our building boards. We need to get our cities and towns more in line with being business friendly. Uh, and, and, you know, we have to balance that with still having, you know, a butter's rights. But we, we have to change the scope of the time periods and the appeals and, and allow the business community to be able to flourish because that brings jobs, it brings activity, and it, and it helps the state grow. So those are, there are some bills that I've put in, and we're looking to put some more bills in, pieces of legislation, that will allow more efficient uh, development to take place in the state of Rhode Island. Good. A any final thoughts on, on the state budget before we uh, wrap up? <laughs> Well, it's a complicated know, it's, process. It's, it's a complicated I process, and, and, uh, and our finance committee, our chairman, Chairman Gallison, uh, you know, they do great work, and they're looking at that budget every day for many, as you know, for many, many hours. Just before this taping, I was there six hours okay, last so they, night. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's something that our, our fiscal staff uh, looks at on a daily basis, as you know, and I'm sure that we're going to come up with some great things for the, for the people of Rhode Island. Leader John D. Simone, thank you so much for coming into our studio tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney. We committed to having several segments of our show dealing with the issue of financial literacy. In our first segment, we talked about the importance of knowing how much money you have in your account and being able to distribute your expenses over the period of time that you have your money, basically balancing your checkbook. We speak briefly about the issue of credit card and credit card debt and how important it is for you to realize that by using your credit card, you are building an expense that has to be built into your regular monthly payments. Oftentimes, credit cards can be seen as one of the potholes along the way. If it's used correctly and avoid it when necessary, it doesn't become a problem. But overuse can become a problem. We want to talk about other sources of those potholes in your life, looking at things like payday loans and rent-to-own situations, or even those situations where you get your income tax prepared and you take an advance on your income tax. Whether we talk about payday loans, income tax advances, rent to own, they all serve a purpose, but one that we have to be educated on. I am very pleased to welcome back Daniel Murphy, Vice President of Home Loan Investment Bank. Daniel is committed to sitting down and having a conversation with us over a series of weeks to talk about the importance of financial literacy. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks again for having me, Bob. Let's talk briefly about those other potholes I talked about, whether we're talking about payday loans. Let's start there. I know that they serve a purpose, and sure. there are people that need them. 
but people need to be educated on how to use them, if to use them, and when to use them. Absolutely. And if, uh, if a person takes advantage of uh, a simple tool like direct deposit, where your employer can deposit your monies, your hard-earned income, directly into your bank account, you could avoid the payday loan situation altogether. That money is going to be secured and delivered into your account every, if it's week or bi-weekly, uh, based upon your earning schedule. And the most important thing about that is that you know your money that you earned is there. When you obtain a payday loan, unfortunately, that paycheck that you worked that hard for, you're not getting 100% of that paycheck. Instead, you're actually getting about 80%. So me personally, if I'm gonna work 100% of my effort and put in my 40 to 50 or 60 hours a week, I wanna get my pay. I wanna get 100% of what I deserve. And unfortunately, those types of loans take advantage of someone who is, again, maybe an unforeseen circumstance or an expense that they didn't account for, they didn't budget for. So it is a tool, unfortunately it's a financial tool that does work against most consumers because it is costly. Uh, and you mentioned rent to own. Rent to own is a situation that again, some people, uh, it, it benefits their personal situation, but it really in the long run, it, it's not something that's gonna benefit you. Rent to own is a short term situation. Uh, the collateral or the property that which you are renting, you are paying a small monthly or sometimes even a weekly expense to have the right to have that item in your home until that balance with that company is zero dollars, they still own that property. So the property that which you are paying uh, weekly or monthly is their collateral and they own it until you make that final payment. Is the interest on those rent to own uh, payments generally higher than it would be if you were to go to the store or to take a, a bank loan or use a line of credit? Yes, uh, to be quite honest with you, they are taking advantage of a certain population that does not have the same financial literacy as you and I. Um, it's not about the fine print, it's just that instead of looking at what would be a fairly large monthly payment, they'll break it down into a convenient weekly payment for you. Unfortunately, if you take that same weekly payment and multiply it, you realize the cost of you obtaining that particular item. So it's always good as an exercise to figure out my wants and versus my needs. What you need is to be able to balance your checkbook. You need to make those, those expenses that are fixed expenses. You need to make those payments to make sure you keep the lights on or you keep uh, your landlord satisfied or your mortgage company, etc. You want to keep those fixed expenses paid so as to not jeopardize your, your budget at the end of the month. The most important thing is when you have a rent to own, uh, a payday loan, or in another example you gave, which was uh, I'm getting an advance on my income tax return. That means that, again, I have an unforeseen circumstance or expense. I do not have the monies readily available. Do not have in my pocket. I do not have in my bank account. And it may cause me, if I were to use a credit card, either take a cash advance from a credit card, which comes, again, at an expense, or if I were to use that credit card to pay for that item. Again, this is a short-term fix, which will inevitably become a long-term problem because I'm going to kick that can down the road by making small interest payments and typically not able to take a big bite or a big chunk of that debt at one, you know, one fell swoop. Uh, so the problem is, is that that credit card debt now is part of my monthly budget. It wasn't a part of my budget before and all of a sudden that rent to own or that payday loan is now, it's forced its way into my budget. Unfortunately, I don't have the monies to afford that situation and it may cause further problems down the road. So I think people have to be very careful that sometimes um, people get enthralled with making a payment by the week because it seems lower. But as you say, you multiply it by four. You may very well have been in a situation where if it was more thought out, sure. better thought out, you could have actually gone and purchased that or used your own money over a period of time, but there may have been a better way of addressing the issue. Absolutely. They, uh, the companies are taking advantage of your impulse buy. They're taking advantage of an irrational rationale at that time, and they're there for you. They're there to catch you, absolutely. And if things don't go quite so well, they're there to take that collateral right back as well. So it's unfortunate, but that is the way that our financial system does work. Well, it's, it's, I'm sure this, you know, it's, it's a tough economy and people are living from paycheck to paycheck. So there are those people that are using it, but what we're saying is that when you come to a program on financial literacy, you have to be aware of what these things are and whether or not they're the best tool for you. I think yeah. you said in our last session, and I was most impressed with it, that if people were to take down on a weekly basis and write down what did you spend and what did you have left at the right. end of the week or at the end of the month, you really become very well versed, very literate mm -hmm. in your financial 
situation plan spending and bills. Absolutely, and sometimes you'll even see someone at the grocery store or uh, at, at another uh, retail store where you'll see them scanning items and they'll look at the, the actual cost and you know a responsible consumer when they see a number that may have exceeded what they were allotting for this trip to the grocery store, put that item back on the shelf, that's a disciplined consumer. That's someone who does not want to overdraw their balance. That's someone who does not want to exceed their credit limit. So that's someone who's been educated and disciplined to know what their expenses are, knows what their income is, and knows what they can afford. And that's really important because you don't want to put yourself in a financial circumstance that's going to put you in a, in a position to force yourself to accept a income tax refund uh, advance. Or you don't want to go from, I want to purchase a vehicle, which again, that, that vehicle is the collateral for a auto loan. But when you're in a rent to own uh, situation or a lease situation, again, you don't own that asset. You're just paying for the right to drive that vehicle for a specific period of time. So in order to grow your personal balance sheet or your personal net worth, it's important to start accumulating assets. And it does start when you start earning monies. If you have money that's earning interest for you, your income is making, well, it's working for you. Well, I think we even said in the last session when we talked about paying yourself first mm. and really putting that little bit of money aside. That leads me to the next topic. And that is people here all the time, we're inundated with advertisements about your credit score. And I think people have a sense of what their credit score is, but there's almost two schools of thought out there. There are those people that are well aware of their credit score and they want to know and they track it. Mm -hmm. And then there's many people who say, I don't know what it is, I don't care what it is, and I really don't want to know. Because I think it's it, it almost becomes an area of fear for them because right. of not knowing. And we know that knowledge is power. Absolutely. And the most important thing we can do is be aware of, the, of numbers like our credit score. Try and explain in a very simple way what does credit score mean and what do those numbers mean? Watching this segment on financial literacy, we look forward to having conversations with you in the next show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.